Good evening. Welcome. My name is Paul Mitchell. I want to welcome you to the Penn Museum uh, for our public classroom, where we will be discussing uh, understanding the history of race and science. This is the first part of a multi-part series of, 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 a, of a multiple uh, of a series of multiple discussions uh, concerning the broad history of race, uh, science including biomedicine, genetics, as well as issues uh, in anthropology and history about geography, culture, uh, and violence. Uh, this is a public discussion which will, in many ways, focus on historical issues, including issues related to the Samuel George Morton Cranial Collection. Uh, and I am very excited today to begin with something of a historical explore, exploration of the uh, racial concepts that we'll be discussing this evening. So with that, uh, I'm going to be asking a series of questions. And I'm looking, really looking, it's not rhetorical, for answers. So on these slides, and do I have a, oh, it's up there. I better get a clicker. Um, I better actually stand by the podium. Uh, I'm going to be asking a series of questions about the history of race, science, and anthropology. And if you have an answer, raise your hand. So we will begin. This one actually goes back rather a long time. Question one. A common interpretation of the biblical account of Noah's three sons in Genesis 10 is that they were progenitors of three major races. Who were his three sons, and what were the three races that he was supposed to have begun? Uh, so, so what's that? Shem, Ham, and Japheth. That's absolutely correct. Uh, they were, uh, Shem was actually uh, supposedly the progenitor of the Asian race. And actually, it's from Shem that we get the word Semites. Uh, Ham was, a par was the progenitor of the alleged African race, and Japheth, the European. This is actually a map uh, that is from the uh, 19th century, early 19th, 19th century, that attempts to use the biblical account as a way to explain human diversity. Next question. What is the name of the pre-Darwinian theory of the separate creation of the races? This one's perhaps a little bit more obscure. Yes? Polygenesis or polygenism, polygenism, absolutely. Apparently this doesn't work that far away. There we go. So very good, pretty good audience. Um, this is uh, actually a portrait of Samuel George Morton, the person who collected these crania here, and probably one of the most important polygenist theorists uh, of the, uh, the pre-Darwinian period. This is actually one of his more important books, Crania Egyptiaca, where he actually attempts to account for what he called the stability of the races going all the way back to the beginnings of creation. And for him, accepting a, bib a biblical chronology, uh, that was pretty much ancient Egypt. Next. I think. Well, trust me, there are more questions. Oh, there we go. There we go. In the first edition of his Systema Naturae, this is really the beginning of scientific classification, in 1735, Carl Linnaeus, the father of modern taxonomy, included descriptions of each of the known of each known living organism in his classification. His entry for Homo, man, although he listed four varieties: the European, the Asian, the American, and the uh, African, he did not describe the, this species like the others. Instead, he only wrote one short phrase. What was that phrase? And as a hint for you philosophers. Uh, Socrates, Socrates uh, liked to use this phrase a lot. So unlike you know, descriptions of anatomy, of physical features, he just said what? Does anybody know? Anybody want to guess? Actually, uh, this is a favorite of Shakespeare's as well. Know thyself. Know thyself. No definition given, no list of traits that you could identify, but rather just the, the phrase know thyself. He later on uh, added to the definition uh, when he included more types of homo sapiens 
uh, in the, the 10th edition of, of the Systema Naturae, he included, uh, for example, Homo monstrosus, uh, that would include whatever he couldn't classify in the other four races that he identified, which included alpine dwarves, Hottentots, giant Patagonians, and other oddities. Um, question four. Johann Friedrich Blumenbach was a German physician uh, who lived uh, between 1752 and 1840. He is widely credited as the founder of physical anthropology and the first craniologist, the first person to study skulls. Uh, he was first, the first to use skull measurements to classify the races. He came up with a scheme of five races exemplified by the five skulls you see below here and actually exemplified by the divisions of the Morton collection that we presented to you uh, at the foot of the stage. What are the races, so-called, that each of these crania represent? The five types, the five, if you like, platonic types of human that were represented in this early attempt at racial classification in natural history. I'll give you one. You've heard of it. It's a funny term. And why we use this word, it's very historically determined. Caucasian. The Caucasian's in the middle. Over here. What he called the Mongolian. Here, the American, the Caucasian again, the Malayan or the Malay, and the Ethiopian. This was the basic scheme that also Morton accepted uh, as being descriptive of the five types of humanity. He really actually thought there were three major types, the Mongolian, the Caucasian, and the Ethiopian, and some intermediate types between them, between the Mongolian and the Caucasian, the American, the Native American, and between the Caucasian and the Ethiopian, the Malayan. Um, question five. This one is a true or false, so you got a 50% chance. A study published in 2001 showed that Morton's measurements of the cranial capacity, that is, the, the, in, the, the volume of the inside of the skull, which is a proxy for brain size, it, sh uh, it showed that these measurements uh, that he made of the skulls uh, in his collection were inaccurate. Uh, it's actually, interestingly, false. But there's a big caveat. So Morton was very good at collecting data. And this is a worthwhile point to make. He pretty accurately measured the, the volume of the brains of the skulls in his collection. The problem is, is that his racial classifications and the assumptions that he had about what bigger brains meant are very, very flawed. Although the data are correct, oftentimes the data don't speak to or lead to a theory that we can accept as correct. And that's one of the interesting, one of the interesting uh, reflections that we can have on Morton, one of many interesting reflections we can have on Morton. Uh, so when remeasuring these crania in, uh, in the uh, early, or in, in around 2010, 2011, Basically, only 2% were significantly different from what Morton reported. Um, but as we said, the racial classifications were arbitrary. The samples were not representative of human variety. And his theories and conclusions were based on false assumptions. OK, this one. This one's kind of fun. What is the study of the shape and the size of the cranium as an indication of character and mental abilities? This now discredited pseudoscience was popular in the early 19th century and it was a major influence on early craniology. Yes? Phrenology. Phrenology. It's Greek, and it means the study of the mind. Uh, and it was actually pioneered by this fellow here, a German guy by the name of uh, Franz Josef Gall. And uh, he, uh, he basically developed this science in order to determine deviant character traits in criminals. Um, but it was, it's certainly an interesting case study in the history of science because although they were basically wrong, they came up with some interesting first ideas. One of them being that certain parts of the brain did particular things. That the front part did something different than the back part, what's sometimes called uh, uh, neural or, or, or uh, uh, localization of brain function. So that's, that's an interesting uh, uh, case study where although basically they were wrong, they had some interesting ideas. Uh, question seven. Uh, true or false, Charles Darwin was born into a family of prominent abolitionists, people opposed to the institution of slavery. And remember, of course, this is you know, basic history, Charles Darwin was British. Uh, and the British history, uh, uh, British history with regard to slavery is different than American history. 
Uh, and so by the time that Charles Darwin was writing his magnum opus, that is, The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection, or remember that Victorian book titles are very long, or the subtitle, The Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle for Life, there was no slavery. In, well, there was no slavery in Great Britain. But was he part of an abolitionist family? Was he for or against slavery? True, he was actually born into a family of prominent abolitionists, which doesn't say whether or not he was for or against slavery, but it, there's good indication from his writings that he's very much against it. Uh, but it doesn't mean that he thought about race in what we might call a progressive way. Nonetheless, he was part of an abolitionist family. His grandfathers, Erasmus Darwin and Josiah Wedgwood, helped form and provided financial assistance to the anti-slavery lobby, which supported William Wilberforce, the major force in abolishing slavery in Great Britain. Question eight. Uh, the American anthropologist Franz Boas was responsible for validating the theory that skull proportions are entirely hereditary. They could not be changed and could be easily used to classify races. He did this by measuring the heads of immigrants to the United States and their US born children and by noticing almost no differences between children and parents. So this is another true or false. Is it the case that Franz Boas in the early 20th century showed that head shape and size is totally hereditary? Yeah, I'm getting the sense that you think this is false, and it is false. Uh, it was certainly, uh, Franz Boas was certainly very influential in, in providing very empirical, uh, very uh, uh, elaborate empirical support uh, against the idea that, that skull size and shape was, was hereditary, although certainly these ideas were falling out of favor at the time. The important thing was is that this, in fact, really helped to start to deconstruct the race idea in anthropology, which doesn't mean that it deconstructed the race idea in uh, the, the wider publics more generally. So finally, uh, we'll stop here at question nine because it seems like a lot of folks are coming in. We want to ask, who was the first non-white professional physical anthropologist? Does anybody know? First person to receive a PhD in anthropology uh, who would not be classified by Morton as a Caucasian. A very important fellow by the name of William Montague Cobb. Uh, he established a very large skeletal collection uh, now at Howard University. And he was also a president of the NAACP. Uh, and then the last question we'll just present as a fact. How many skulls are in the Morton collection? 50 of which you see here in front of you. There are 1,500. It was known as the American Golgotha. And with that, I will welcome you to this evening's discussion uh, by turning the floor over to the museum director, Dr. Julian Siggers.